Okay. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome to my presentation on comparing DNA ethnicity estimates. I chose this image because it shows a common reaction to ethnicity reports, and maybe that's you too. Uh, maybe your results uh, were not consistent with your family tree. Maybe you tested with more than one company and got uh, strikingly different results, or maybe you and a sibling took the same test and you do not look like you shared the same ancestors. Well, I got into DNA testing because DNA solved a personal mystery. Uh, 17 years ago, I was an accidental pioneer. Uh, I was the first known case of an adoptee identifying birth family through genetic genealogy. And my biological parents are shown here, and you may have read the book I wrote, Finding Family, My Search for Roots and the Secrets in My DNA. I have another presentation that summarizes my search and gets into adoptee searches in general and a lot more on surprise DNA matches. So here's what we're going to cover today. I will explain why ethnic ancestry has become such a hot feature. Uh, you will learn many reasons why results don't match expectations, why Native American ancestry is so rarely found, and why results vary by company. Then we're going to compare the results of eight different DNA tests on one person of European ancestry. And some other examples will include siblings, an African American, and a person of Mexican ancestry. And then I'll share some conclusions. Some of you may remember this ad. The man traded his lederhosen for a kilt because an ancestry DNA test told him he was Scottish instead of German. It was one of the first ads to promote the ethnic ancestry feature of an autosomal DNA test. Well, you might wonder why they decided to run ads like this. Well, let's look at the market for at-home DNA tests. Uh, the original target was the genealogy market, and only a fraction of genealogists were ordering the tests. After my success, many more adoptees began to test, looking for birth parents and siblings. Then others who discovered the man who raised them was not their biological father, also began testing, even, even children of sperm donors. But the overall market still wasn't huge and growth was modest. Well, by targeting people who are simply curious about their ethnic ancestry, the testing companies have created a far bigger market. Uh, for the most part, it includes the people in the first three groups, uh, since most of us are also curious about our ethnic ancestry. I'm sorry. Well, the strategy worked. Uh, after the ethnicity ad started, growth in the autosomal DNA databases skyrocketed. The total number of people tested is now estimated to be nearly 40 million, with 25 million of them taking the ancestry DNA test alone. Well, this explosive growth in testing, it's, it's one of those good news, bad news situations. Uh, the good news for genealogists is that we are seeing many more matches and adoptees are finding closer matches, which makes the search for birth families easier. The bad news is that most of these new testers are not genealogists and know little or nothing about their family trees. But there is hope. Ethnicity reports are the gateway drug to genealogy. Some of these people who tested for ethnicity reasons are getting hooked on genealogy, and we can help them along when we encounter them in our matches. 
the ethnicity reports themselves are not always well received. Countless people have been confused or even shocked by their ethnicity results. So why don't the results match expectations? Well, one big reason is the issue of random inheritance. Yes, we get 50% of our DNA from our mother, but which 50% we get is random. And it's the same thing in our father's DNA. So here's an example. Let's say your four grandparents are German, English, Italian, and Swedish you would expect your ethnicity to show up in four equal parts of 25% each. Well, to demonstrate this concept of random inheritance, let's represent your four grandparents by the four suits in a deck of cards. Hearts for your paternal grandfather, diamonds for your paternal grandmother, and so on. Now open two decks of playing cards and set up two new decks. One with all 52 red cards representing your paternal side and another with the 52 black cards representing your maternal side. Start with the red deck and shuffle all 52 red cards together and then deal out the first 26. Will you get exactly 13 hearts and 13 diamonds? Well, maybe, but most likely it won't be an even split. Then you repeat that process with the black cards for your maternal side, and once again, an uneven split of some kind is the more likely outcome, as anyone who plays bridge can attest. As a result of this randomness, we can inherit significantly different amounts of DNA from each grandparent. One possible split is shown here. 33% from your paternal grandfather and only 17% from your paternal grandmother. And the same kind of uneven split can occur on your mother's side. Well, this random inheritance also explains why siblings will see different ethnicity results. Each conception is a unique event with its own random selection of each parent's DNA. Using our playing card analogy, the cards are reshuffled and dealt again. It's a whole new game. So unless you have an identical twin, each brother or sister will only share about half of your DNA, and they will often show a different mix of ethnicities. Well, beyond random inheritance, there are many other reasons why results don't match expectations. First, people expect ethnicity to match recent ancestors' countries of origin. Instead, what we get is something they call admixture, and that can reflect hundreds of far more distant ancestors. Let's look at one of your grandparents and assume you received an average of 25% of your DNA from him. That means 12.5% from each of his parents and about 6% from each of their parents and so on. Well, random inheritance doesn't just affect your generation. It happened at every step down your family tree. So let's go back to your great, 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 great grandparents you have 64 of them, and 16 are in this particular grandparent's branch. Well, their average contribution to your DNA is about 1.5%. But due to random inheritance, some of them have dropped way below that average to undetectable levels. And that means that some of the distant ancestors in your genealogical family tree are not part of your genetic family tree. And here's another issue. We cannot be certain of every, every ancestor's real ethnicity going back hundreds of years. Throughout history, many ethnic groups have faced serious and sometimes quite dangerous discrimination. And I'm sure you can think of examples. Some of our ancestors may have adopted a different ethnicity than what they were born with. 
A huge complicating factor is the movement and mixing of people. And the Vikings are a great example, as, as shown in this map of their voyages, going way back into the 700s and 800s. They even ventured into the Mediterranean and up some of the rivers in Eastern Europe and Russia. And just like modern sailors away from home for a long time, Viking men left their DNA behind in the local population. Finally, notice that the title of this map is Territories and Voyages of the Vikings. So let's look at this close-up of the British Isles and the coast of France. Those light green areas represent Viking settlements. For whatever reason, maybe milder winters, many Vikings decided to stay. So for more than a thousand years, a lot of Viking DNA has been mixing with other ethnicities in such areas. In modern times, we have national borders between countries, but this should remind us that nationality and genetic ethnicity are not the same thing. Well, because of all this movement, many ethnicities are difficult to distinguish genetically. Those Vikings made it challenging to separate Vikings or Scandinavian from British ancestry. In France and Germany, they, they share a single landmass with no natural barriers to impede migration. And even in modern times, the border between those two countries has changed numerous times. Italy and the Middle East are both on the Mediterranean Sea, and traffic between the two regions has been continuous since even before the Roman Empire. Another thing to note, our test reports often include some very small numbers, like 2% or 3% or even 0.2%. These tiny numbers could be real or they could just be statistical noise. So be very careful about drawing conclusions from these small percentages. Some ethnicities do stand out clearly. The basic distinction, distinction among European, African, and Asian is obvious because those original migrations out of Africa go back hundreds of thousands of years. It's when we try to break down those continents into modern day countries that things get fuzzy. Ashkenazi Jewish is quite distinctive because it's an endogamous society where people have married within their own community for thousands of years. And finally, that original Native American DNA is also quite distinctive. So here's a puzzle. Even though Native American DNA does stand out, very few Americans of European ancestry are seeing it in our ethnicity reports. According to 23andMe, only 2.7% show any Native American DNA and less than 1% have 2% or more. Well, Native An American ancestry is a hot topic, so let's take a few minutes to explore that subject. Throughout most of human history, the Americas were devoid of people. Then, thousands of years ago, the first Native Americans arrived from Asia. Some of them crossed a land bridge that existed for a time across the Bering Strait, and others may have come by sea. More than 500 years ago, Europeans began arriving in what to them was the New World. And they came to explore, plunder, and form settlements. And this map shows some of the earliest arrivals of the Vikings, English, French, and Spanish to North and Central America. Well, as paintings like this remind us, Native Americans began to mix with Europeans. And European DNA began to dilute that original Native American DNA. 15 or 20 generations later, 
most Native Americans had significant amounts of European DNA. And whatever fragments of that Asian-derived DNA they still had continued to decline at every generation going forward. Here's a fascinating map from 23andMe. It shows the percentage of European Americans in each state that have at least 2% Native American ancestry. In the Eastern states, that is mostly 1% or less. Farther west, it can be as high as 4%. And that makes sense because the Eastern tribes have been in contact with Europeans longer. If you have a family legend of a Cherokee ancestor, your odds of showing Native American DNA on one of these tests are not good. Well, you might wonder why we don't sample enough of today's Native Americans to create a modern reference population. Well, very few living Native Americans will agree to be tested. And as a result, Native Americans are simply not well represented in the genetic genealogy databases. But it doesn't really matter. Here are some key points I learned from genetic genealogy expert Blaine Bettinger. Having Native American DNA is not the same as being Native American. To be Native American, an indigenous community must claim you. And no DNA test can prove that you are or are not Native American. If you have tested with more than one DNA testing company, you have surely noticed that your ethnicity reports can vary, and often by quite a lot. Well, first of all, the challenges and limitations I covered apply to every DNA testing company. None of them have a magic bullet to get around these issues. Now we add in the fact that each company approaches the estimation of ethnicity in its own unique way. Well, here are four major differences. Genetic genealogy tests do not test all our DNA. They check large samples through what are called chips. The first companies used an off-the-shelf chip that sampled the same locations. Now, most of them are using customized chips. For example, a company that's also interested in the health side of DNA will choose more medically significant locations. Companies use different reference populations with vastly different regions and numbers. For example, let's say you have ancestry from Lithuania. If you test with a company that has a good-sized reference population specific to that area, they could report you as Lithuanian. Companies that don't have that can only include you in some larger regions, such as Baltic or maybe just Eastern Europe. Each company has a unique proprietary algorithm for comparing our DNA with their reference populations. And each one probably thinks their way is best, but they are inevitably different. Finally, each testing company defines different regional groupings and gives them inconsistent names. And you will see many examples of that when we get into some specific findings. So let's test one person on every major test and compare the results. My own ancestry is nearly all British, so it's just way too narrow for interesting comparisons. My wife, Pat, however, has a great mix of ethnicity for comparing DNA tests. Both of her paternal grandparents were born in Croatia, so we can expect 50% of her ancestry to be from regions that include Croatia. And that gives us a good standard for comparison. Her known maternal ancestry comes from farther north in England, France, and Germany. 
Well, to create this presentation, I bought these eight tests and had Pat do every one. Ancestry DNA, 23andMe, Family Tree DNA's Family Finder, My Heritage, Living DNA, CRI Genetics, Geno 2.0, and Int Satomi. Now, none of these use data transferred from another test. She had to spit into a tube or swab her cheeks for every one of them. Now, Pat is not a genealogist, yet she was a pretty good sport most of the time. I, I, I did hear some complaints. In addition to her many other fine qualities, Pat is now an accomplished expert at using both spit kits and cheek swabs. As I said earlier, half of Pat's ancestry is from Croatia. On this map, Croatia is shown in dark green, just across the Adriatic Sea from Italy. It's part of the Balkan Peninsula that stretches from Hungary down to Greece. Now, Pat's ancestors lived for centuries on the long, narrow strip of southern Croatia known as the Dalmatian Coast. I mentioned earlier that each testing company has different regional groupings with inconsistent names. Here are the regions that could reflect Croatian ancestry for each of the eight companies. Just skimming the list will show that they vary considerably in name and geography, and I'll give you a moment to do that. And it's not just different names, but vastly different groupings. Now, here's a comparison of the Family Finder and Ancestry DNA maps from my wife's European ancestry. Take a minute to compare them, and you'll see they, they don't have a whole lot in common. They cover the same areas, but they're grouped very differently. Well, let's go through these eight tests. We'll start... Uh, with Pat's ethnicity report on the Incitomi Regional Ancestry Test. Now, this test is no longer being offered. For each report, I am flagging the regions that include Croatia with green symbols and adding up the percentages. On Incitomi, that's North Mediterranean and East European for a total of 41%. And then I mark anything that is totally outside her known ancestry with a red question mark. In this case, that's 8% Basque and 7% Ashkenazi. Next, we'll look at Pat's results on Geno 2.0, the National Genographic Test that is no longer being offered to the public. The two regions that include Croatia on Geno 2.0 are Eastern Europe and a region broadly identified as Italy and Southern Europe. They total 47%. Like the Incitomi test, this one also shows some Jewish ethnicity. And I mentioned earlier that Jewish DNA is generally pretty detectable, yet none of the other six tests found any of it in Pat's DNA. Here are Pat's results on the CRI genetics test. I had not included this test originally, but they were advertising heavily and many people were asking me for my opinion. So I had Pat do this one too. The only region on this test that includes Croatia is called Southern Central Slavic at about 20%. It looks like much of her Croatian was misidentified as Italian. The sum of those two regions would be 46%. The small amounts from Spain and Scandinavia are outside her known ancestry and could just be statistical noise. As you can see from this recent news item, CRI Genetics was overselling the accuracy of its ancestry reports. Thankfully, they got caught and both the FTC and the state of California obtained orders against them and uh, to halt their deceptive con 
conduct and even pay a civil penalty. Good for them. Now, here's the My Origins report that's included with Pat's Family Finder test results. The three regions that cover Croatia total 41%. Two of the questionable regions are marked with a black circle that identifies them as trace percentages, which may not be real. The odd one here is Baltic. That covers Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. So far, we have not discovered any of Pat's ancestry from that region. Now let's look at Pat's ethnicity breakdown on my heritage. Whoops. There we go. Balkan and East European add up to 45%. And Iberian would be Spain and Portugal, which does not fit any known ancestry. But there are hints of this in some of the other reports. Now, Finnish may just be noise. My Heritage also reports what they call genetic groups. They look at the family trees of her genetic matches to supplement the ethnicity numbers. This even includes some recent migrations within the United States. Now, many of Pat's mother's ancestors migrated through Pennsylvania and Ohio before ending up in Michigan. Had we not known this already, such a clue could have been helpful. Living DNA is known for breaking out British ancestry into subregions. It breaks mine into nine of them because I have so much British ancestry. Since the latest update, it only placed Pat into two larger regions. Living DNA has a pretty specific region called West Balkans that does include Croatia. They also have a region called Pannonia that touches northern Croatia for a total of 53%. The 1.6% in the region they call Northeast Europe is nowhere near any of Pat's known ancestry, but it does include the Baltic region reported in Family Finder. That ancestry could be from a branch we have not yet identified. Well, next let's look at Pat's ethnicity breakdown on 23andMe. Nearly all of Pat's Croatian ancestry is reported in the Greek and Balkan region. Add in the small amount classified as Eastern European, and the Croatian total is 49%. The only question marks here are traces of Scandinavian and Italian that are so small they may just be noise. Notice the amount of sub-regional detail included with this report such as Bavaria under French and German and Greater London under British and Irish. In Croatia, 23andMe actually breaks out her evidence of ancestry into counties. The top three counties are all along the Dalmatian coast. I've added red dots to show the villages where her paternal grandfather and grandmother were born. Their ancestors had been in those areas for many generations. This report does show an impressive level of detail for these ancestral locations. Twenty three and Me also provides a timeline to estimate how far back these different ethnicities appeared in your family tree. Pat's paternal grandparents were born in the 1870s, and the Balkan timeline is clearly the most recent. Her mother's known ancestors from France, Germany, and the British Isles have been in the U.S. much longer. The Italian and Scandinavian, if they are real, reflect ancestors much farther back. 
23andMe also reports where specific ethnicities appear on your chromosomes. You can highlight certain ethnicities as I did here with British and Irish. Notice that these all appear on the top of each chromosome pair. That means it all came from the same parent, in this case, her mother. And by the way, do not assume that the top row is always the mother. There is no fixed order. Finally, here is Pat's ethnicity report from the Ancestry DNA test. On this test, Croatia is covered directly by the Balkans. A second group called Eastern Europe and Russia is closely related. They total 50%. Notice that they have specifically identified her Balkan ancestry as Croatian and from the Dalmatian coast. Ancestry has a supplemental report called Genetic Communities. Similar to genetic groups on MyHeritage, this is based on the family trees of Pat's genetic matches. It looks for geographic clusters in a more recent time frame. The first one confirms Pat's paternal ancestry in Croatia. The second one reflects her maternal site ancestry in Pennsylvania. Ancestry has introduced a technology called SideView that assigns your ethnicity to your individual parents without testing them. The ethnicities are color-coded by the regions listed below. The half circles on the left show the breakout for each parent, and the full circle on the right shows your breakout. You can select certain ethnicities to view them individually. Her father's Croatian ancestry is perfectly matched with the Balkans and Eastern European regions. And it's a good thing I copied this earlier. Ancestry has recently introduced a subscription service called Ancestry DNA Plus that costs about $30 every six months. Sadly, they have moved this feature and some others behind the paywall, and you cannot get it anymore without the added subscription. Well, here's a table to summarize Pat's results for her three known ethnicities, Croatian, French and German, and British, on all eight tests. Now, if you go across the rows, you'll know that many of the rows total less than 100% because most of these tests also reported DNA from additional regions. Now, Geno 2.0 and Incitomi, they could not even distinguish French and German from British. They just reported very broad regions called Western Europe or Northwestern Europe. There's a lot of detail here, and I'm going to leave this table up for a bit and proceed slowly as I direct your attention to different parts. With Pat's paternal ancestry all from Croatia, we expected to see about 50% of that from, from that area. Well, except for that 20% from CRI genetics, which misread much of that ancestry as Italian, Every test showed this as her largest group, and many of them were around 50%. Estimates of Pat's French and German ancestry, however, varied tremendously. They go from a low of 11% on my heritage to a high of 41% on Family Finder. And naturally, the tests showing low French and German report high percentages of British. The range goes all the way from 8% on living DNA to 32% on ancestry. Well, now let's compare two full siblings who did the same test. My son and daughter both tested on Family Finder. My son shows 39% Scandinavian, which I noted can be confused with British. My daughter shows no Scandinavian at all, 
and with three quarters of her DNA simply lumped in Central Europe. Each of them shows some ancestry from Eastern and Southern Europe, which reflects their mother's Croatian side. This is why I tell people to never draw any conclusions about relatedness from a DNA ethnicity report. I transferred the family finder data from my children to my heritage. So each company is looking at the same data in this case. But my heritage still has different reference populations, a different algorithm for comparing data to the references, and different regional groupings. Now, my son showed 39% Scandinavian on Family Finder, but that has been more correctly identified as British ancestry here. Yet, strangely, neither test can break out three quarters of my daughter's DNA into anything more precise than central or North and West European. I wanted to include some examples of ancestry outside of Europe. Shannon Christmas, an African-American genealogy expert, graciously shared his 23andMe results with me. He is mostly Nigerian with contributions from several other African regions. And with no paper records on the earliest slave ancestors, this, this has to be fascinating for anyone of African ancestry. And like nearly all African Americans, Shannon has some European ancestry probably introduced during the era of slavery. His biggest piece is British and Irish at 6%. Most of the numbers on the right side of this table are so small that they may just be noise. In case you were wondering, there is no such thing as Mexican DNA. Like the United States, Mexico is a melting pot of ethnicities. Moises Garza, a specialist in Mexican genealogy, shared his 23andMe results with me. If you think about it, the first Europeans in Mexico were Spanish conquistadors. Mostly young, single men, they were there a long time, and some of them stayed for good. The only women around were Native American. And as a result, Mexicans typically have a mix of Spanish and Native American ancestry. And like most countries in the Americas, Mexico also received many slaves from Africa. So that ancestry is also common among people of Mexican descent. Well, of the eight tests that Pat did, three of them stand out to me as clearly inferior. Incitomi, Geno 2.0, and CRI Genetics did the worst in measuring ethnicity. Plus, none of these three report your genetic matches with other testers. Well, there are many other companies offering DNA ethnicity tests today that are also a big waste of money. And I don't name them because I don't want to give them any publicity. But here are some warning signs. Do not take any ethnicity test that is based on STR markers. Any test that promises to tr place you into a specific Native American or African tribe. And any test that promises to trace your ancestors to a specific village. These companies are selling wishful thinking to people who don't know better and don't know about better alternatives. So, which tests do I recommend for ethnicity purposes? 23andMe and Ancestry DNA have the most varied and innovative ethnicity reports. And in Pat's case, they clearly did the best job of measuring her 50% Croatian ancestry from her father's side. Yet even those reports disagree considerably when it comes to her mother's Northern European ancestry. Unfortunately, we don't have enough of her lines traced to Europe to even guess which test did, did a better job on that. 
Well, your results will be quite different from Pat's results. Your mix of ethnicities is different. Testing company strengths are not uniform over all regions. Companies add reference populations and adjust their algorithms periodically, and our results do change over time. I first created this presentation for a Roots Tech conference, and I keep revising it as her results change. Well, early in this presentation, I stated with confidence that Pat's paternal side was all Croatian. How we identified her paternal family tree is a reminder that breakthrough matches can appear anywhere. Now, Pat's mother did, Pat's brother did a Y DNA test at Family Tree DNA, and not surprisingly, his matches have direct paternal lines from the area in and around Croatia. As the one managing his account, I was contacted by the sister of a Y DNA match. She is a genealogist living in Croatia who reads and writes English, and she offered to help. I shared the names, birth dates, and villages of Pat's grandparents, which were all we knew at the time. This woman searched the Croatian state archives and even traveled to the parish churches that served their ancestral villages. She copied and translated the records from Italian and Croatian into English. Well, thanks to the information provided by this Croatian genealogist, I can now trace every branch of Pat's Croatian ancestry into the 1700s. And with more ancestors in her family tree, I can now see exactly how Pat connects to several of her third and fourth cousin paternal side matches on the autosomal DNA test. Well, unfortunately, the common male ancestor that was responsible for the Y DNA match was too far back. So we never did figure out the connection to the ge Croatian genealogist and her brother. So what should we conclude about DNA testing for ethnicity? I recommend that you keep things in perspective. In the world of genetic genealogy, ethnicity estimates are still the sideshow. They're certainly interesting and something to talk about or debate. And in some cases, they may even provide useful clues. But for genealogists and adoptees, the main event under the big top is the reporting of genetic matches. That's the information most likely to expand and confirm our family trees and introduce us to previously unknown relatives. Well, each DNA test has a separate database of mostly different people. And your most useful matches may show up anywhere. And now that prices are so low and some companies do accept free uploads of raw data from others, you really should be in every database that provides matching. Well, this concludes my presentation on ethnicity testing. I, I currently have three other presentations. Uh, one of them is a great introduction to every DNA test type and the companies that offer them. And I actually gave that to your group uh, several weeks ago. Uh, and there is a, a recording of it available. Uh, another one is a great introduction. Uh, excuse me. Another one uh, uh, shares my personal DNA success story, and it covers today's tools for finding unknown relatives and interpreting surprise matches. And the third one uh, dives deeply into the subject of why DNA testing. And each presentation is entirely different. So if you enjoy this one, I'd, I'd be happy to uh, return for uh, one of the last two you haven't seen yet. I have a question about the um, about a program that you can use with um, Ancestry that does the family tree and makes it easier to handle. I have trouble getting around uh, Ancestry.com, actually. I have trouble with their tree, and I heard there are some programs that you can get that use their tree, but they're easier for you to manage. Do you know of any? 
I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about. There, the newest program out there is one called Banyan DNA, and you can look that up. That's uh, uh, a way to uh, uh, it's a pretty powerful tool for working with your matches, organizing them, and, and helping to figure out your genealogy from. Them. That's that's the newest and most most powerful tool that I'm that I am aware of. I would look that up. It's Banyan B A N Y A N D N A dot com, I think. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Could, can you hear me? I can. Yes. Yes, this is Annette Fister in Summit. Um, I'm very interested in the Y DNA. And if you could tell me a little bit more about that, because I I understand that I, as a female, don't really carry the Y chromosome. And I have absolutely no male rel relatives that I could do DNA testing to get that side of the family. Uh, does your presentation cover some of that? The Y no, DNA no. presentation gets yeah. into it very, very mm -hmm. deeply. You are you are correct. Uh, the uh, one pair of our chromosomes is sex chromosomes, and uh, women get an X from each parent, men get an X from their mother, and a Y from their father. So the Y chromosome follows directly down the paternal line. Uh, it goes from father to son. Sun, 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 like that, you know, all the way down. And because it doesn't change much, it it can reach back uh, hundreds of years, really. So it's it's a pretty powerful tool for looking at the direct paternal line. Now, don't think that because you are a female that you are not getting matches from your father's side. And if you do a, uh, an autosomal test like uh, ancestry DNA, 23andMe, my heritage, and so on, uh, you will get you can get matches from any branch of your family tree. Uh, what the Y DNA test does is is focus very narrowly on the direct paternal line, going right up your father's 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 father's. And many women do test, but you know to do that you have to have, for example, a brother, your father. Uh, a brother of your father, a son of your of a brother of your father, and if that doesn't work, your father's father, and then another son. Of, you know, you can keep going farther back to find some male that is in that direct line. And that explains why on my father's side, I can go back on his mother's side to the 1600s, and it dead ends on his father's side. And I'm glad that uh, Irene is recording them for you for each one because there is a lot of information that I have to go through in a fairly short time. So it does help to be able to go back and watch it again. And of course, there are people that in your uh, in your group that uh, that uh, were not here tonight or couldn't do it, so they can uh, watch it for the first time. Seventeen. Mm -hmm. You know, we can try to buy it. Or if you want the book, any of you, you can call us at reference and we'll find it uh, in the libraries uh, in New Jersey. It, it will be done through interlibrary loan and you will receive it. Definitely somebody has it and probably a few co copies. Unfortunately, our library doesn't have it. I don't know why, but we, we don't have it. And here's yeah. another option. I do have author signed copies that... Uh... That I will ship to you for you send twenty dollars, um, and you order it through findingfamilybook.com. That goes to a specific order page on my website, and then uh, uh, from there uh, I can uh, I will get your email address, your shipping address, and so on, and I will uh, be able to sign and, and mail a book to you. A number of people like like to do that. Some people just like to get an author signed book for themselves or for a gift. And this yeah, is my website. This will take take you that would take you to my website, but my website, the main address is dnafavorites.com. Now, one more thing on the book is some of us like audiobooks, and there is an audiobook version of my book available through Audible, which is owned by Amazon. So if you go to Amazon, you would also find the link to the uh 
printed version, the, the uh, Kindle version, and the audiobook version. I did not speak the audiobook. We had a professional reader do that.